Welcome back to my channel, I'm Brian Kapke, and in this video, we're gonna talk about using and creating Python function decorators. But before I jump in, please consider supporting me on Patreon, where you get direct access to me, specialized content, early access to videos without commercials, among the benefits, even periodic live meetings with me. All right, so let's jump into this. This is a really exciting topic for me. I've been fascinated with decorators in Python for a while. And unlike these nice little decorations here, they're really quite powerful and can do a lot. So what do we need to know? Well, first of all, there's a nice link here I put into the notebook. And I will put a link to the notebook in the description for this video. And this gives you a lot of nice documentation on Python decorators that somebody was nice enough to put out there. So feel free to Check that out. What do we want to know about Python decorators? First of all, I want to drive home a really key point of why you need to know them, which is they are everywhere. They are ubiquitous in the Python language. So if you want to know Python and you want to be skilled at this, you need to understand decorators, how to use them, what are they when you see them, and all that stuff. They could very easily come up in interviews, so you want to stick around for this video. They offer a powerful, and I use this word rarely elegant, way to extend functions because you don't have to change the code in the function and yet you can add new abilities to it. So that's pretty cool. Best of all, they provide an extensible and maintainable way to add standard functionality to your functions. This is really key. Think about things like logging, or maybe you just wanna do some testing of functions and things. You wanna be able to do that without changing the individual functions. Because if you think about something like logging, you wanna do standardized logging, right? Wouldn't it be nice if we could just say, I wanna add this logging functionality to 5,000 functions without having to go in and write custom code inside each function. And imagine also, there's a requirement change. They said, oh, you are writing to this log file. That's going away. You need to write it somewhere else. Or maybe you're writing to some service or that changes from one service to the other. The point is, if you need to change anything and you hard coded that logic in every function, then it's not scalable and it's not very maintainable. And that is not a good idea. Function decorators are a way around that to provide a really nice solution to this. Decorators are ideal for providing an easy way for users to plug into your framework. It's actually the reason why you see them used in so many very popular frameworks, which is going to be the first part of what I want to discuss. When you're looking at code, you can tell there's a decorator involved because right above the function, you'll see the at sign and some text label. That is a decorator. We're gonna see how that works. So you can see this example here, just at some decorator over a function definition, def my function. That's how you know when you see them in code that you're reading, and that's how you also use them for yourself. Let's take a look at popular uses in frameworks all around the Python ecosystem that you will probably run into if you start to use popular packages. So one of the most popular Python frameworks out there is one that allows you to write very extensible and powerful web applications, and it's called Django. And guess what? We can see an example here from the Django documentation. It says at require HTTP methods, and it has these parameters. And then that's right over a person's custom function, an example, my underscore view. They use them quite a bit in Django. Another example is here. If you've heard of Apache Airflow, Airflow uses decorators quite a bit. Now, do we have to use decorators in these cases? Actually, no, there is a way to use a different syntax other than the at sign syntax. But I would suggest sticking to the at sign syntax above functions when you use decorators because it is very standard. It is ubiquitous. Anybody who knows Python coding immediately sees that at sign label above a function and they know, okay, that's a decorator. But I will show you a different way you could code that without using the at sign syntax. But here we see in Apache Airflow, at DAG, and then some parameters going in and that's right above a task flow. So you guessed it, you're creating a job, which they call a DAG, and you're going to define a flow, a workflow within that DAG. And so you say task flow, and then notice even within that function, there's another sub function. And above that is the at task decorator. What about Flask? I just read something that Flask is the most popular Python framework. I'm not sure if that's true across the border, just when it comes to web applications, but Flask is extremely popular. And here's an example of how you would use decorators in Flask. And this is an interesting one because it has multiple decorators. They're sort of stacked. So first, you know, working your way up right above the function, it's going to go into a authenticate. Decorated. Then it goes to serialize, then deserialize, and apps.route. So you've got a lot of decorators. So kind of interesting, but decorators can be stacked up. And finally, this is an example of using them with Delta Live tables. I recently did a video all about Delta Live tables and how they're cool and everything else. And here we can see at dlt.table, at dlt.expect. So again, we're stacking these decorators above our function 
And all of these are examples of hooking into a framework. And you can too. You can write your very own. And finally, I want to point you to this documentation, which lists standard decorators available in the Python library. So go for it. You can use them for your very own. Take a look at them. All right, Brian, that's great. I know they're used a lot, but how do I do it myself? What's going on here? So what I'm going to talk about now, the decorators, is very closely related to my last video, which was on functions as first class objects. And we talked about this kind of thing here. We have something here. Notice I just call it a decorator. That's the big change, right? But it doesn't have to be called decorator. I'm writing an outer function, my decorator. The parameters to it are a function object, args, and kwag. Now, the reason for args and kwags is that if I'm going to decorate a function and it has arguments, which often they do, or keyword arguments, k kw args, then this will take care of that. It will handle it. So all of that function call would be passed into this my decorator. Now I have a sub function, new function, and I'm defining the args and kwags here. And now I'm going to just do some logic. I'm going to say, okay, something is happening here. This could be really like logging, right? I could say, I'm going to write to my log or here's a function, et cetera. Here I call the function. This is really critical. If you do a decorator, you got to remember to call the function passed in. Otherwise, it basically negates running your function completely, which you don't want to do. So here it's calling the function, and then it's going to pass in any arguments and pass in any keyword argument. Then here we say print. Your arguments are print. Keyword arguments are. And then print something is happening after the function is called. Just so you can kind of see we had something before and something after. This example really is identical to what you would want to do if you were writing to a log. You want to have this sort of custom logging decorator that would just, you put over something and now it logs when a function was called, what the arguments were, and on and on. You get everything right there. The nice thing is, again, it's reusable. So let's take a look. We've got this function. Let me run this. And we're going to now create a function. First, we'll show you the function without the decorator so you know how this looks. Creating a really silly function here, say we, right? It takes two parameters and it takes keyword arguments. And here we're going to say print we, that was fun. And then we'll print out from the keyword arguments the name. And then we'll call the function, say we, passing one in as x, two in as y, and the keyword argument, Tom. Let's run the function. And it's very simple, right? It's just saying we, that was fun, Tom. All right, we didn't even really do anything with the one and two, but that's okay. Now let's see the same function, but we'll put the decorator, my decorator that we created here, right? over it. We just define the function as we did before, nothing different. The only change is I've added a decorator over it. So we'll run this function definition with the decorator now, and let me do the same execution. Oh, wow, the function execution behavior changed. What happened? Well, we're seeing from the decorator, it says something is happening before the function is called. Then it does the message, which is actually executing the function. The arguments from the function are one and two, even though they weren't actually used in the function. The keyword arguments are name and Tom. Keyword arguments essentially are like diction parameters that you can pass in, right? And finally, our message. Something is happening after the function is called. This is very powerful. What's going on here? Well, what we're actually doing is passing this function into this function. It's a notation. So this is really just what they call syntactic sugar. We're really calling the decorator function, my decorator, and passing in our function as an object to it. And then that function, that decorator, let's go above here, is going to do some stuff. And whenever it decides to, it wants to execute that function. Now, a crucial thing to understand here that I talked a lot about in my last video is we pass back the new function. So here we've got our inner function. And when we call my decorator, it's only passing back new function. That's key. So it doesn't actually do anything. But when we execute our function that has the decorator, it's going to execute the inner function. And that's pretty magical. Let's try a different function. Let's see how this works. I'm going to define another function. This one, it's just going to print other. Very simple. And I'm going to use my decorator with a different syntax just to demonstrate how that could work. I'm going to create a little v object variable. And I'm going to say it's equal to my decorator, and I'm passing in other func. So I'm passing in my function as an object to it. Then I'm going to execute b as a function. That's why the parameters. And notice it did the exact same thing as the prior one. I didn't have any arguments or parameters, so nothing to display, but it used the decorator. And while this syntax can be used, it is less clear to the reader, I believe, of what you're trying to do 
Whereas the at decorated syntax is so standard that it's a better way to go in most cases, unless you have a real need to do some other format. Not really wrong. I don't think anyone's going to say use the other way is wrong, but in the interest of being clear and understandable in your code, I would use the standard decorator syntax. The key takeaway I want you to get from that is imagine you have 5,000 functions. It's a big application. And you've come in and you say, wow, there's no logging anywhere in this. This has happened to me. And you're like, how do I add logging to all of these functions? Well, one way is you could go into each function and start adding like a call to a logging function with a parameter. And you say, that's pretty extensible, right? But what happens if the parameters to your logging functions change? Well, then you're going to have to go into 5,000 functions and change it. But suppose somebody says you got to rename that function. We don't like it. <laughs> Again, you're going to have to go in and change 5,000 functions. But something far more sinister is that any time you go in and change your code that's already been tested and proven, those functions that do the work, you're running the risk of breaking your code, which means a lot of testing, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. And I don't like that. So instead, by using decorators, you test your decorator out. You know the decorator works. You know your functions, your decorating work. So your risk of having problems is far lower. And if there is a problem with the decorator, something like logging, you can say, you know what, for this function, just for now, let's just remove the decorator and go forward. You're not editing code, checking it through. You will have to remove the decorator, but that's pretty straightforward as we've seen. Just one line of code, comment it, and you're good to go. So let me show you a really cool everyday use of decorators. And I've left a link here because that's where I got this code. So I'm not trying to take credit for this, but I do want to walk through it. Take a look at that link. It's pretty cool information. Some of these links may have a lot of pop-ups, so just be aware of that. So we're going to be importing from Funk Tools a function called Wraps, and then we're going to import time. The purpose of this decorator is to take a function and time how long it takes to execute, which of course is really useful in the dev environment, right? You're developing something, you're saying, What's going on? How long does this function take? Or it could be good for troubleshooting performance issues. You're running a long chain, say like a data engineering pipeline, and it's taking six hours where it used to run in 20 minutes. You could go through individual functions using something like this decorator, check and say, oh, this is the function that's taking so long. Now you would do that probably like in a dev environment, but then you can remove the decorator once you've done your testing. Now later, I will show you a way that you could parameterize your decorator so you could actually have to create like an outer outer function, but that allows you to pass parameters specifically for the use of your decorator so that instead of using like a time it decorator for this and then having to remove it, you could have like a parameter like debug mode. And then when you need to change, you just change that flag so that it's no longer debug mode, it's production mode, which means don't do this timing thing no more. You may not have funk tools installed. If not, you can do one of those pip installs. You can Google that or whatever, but you may need to bring that in. Uh, time should be, I believe, in the built-in library. But again, if it's not in the standard library, you need it just, you can pip install. So we're going to now create a little function, which is really a decorator function. And it takes the function in as a parameter. It then uses the at wraps of the function. And here it's defining our inner function. And remember, the inner function is what's going to get returned. The inner function is called time it underscore wrapper. It takes args, and kwargs, so it's getting all the necessary parameters from the function. It then calls time.perfCounter to get the starting time. It then calls the function here and gets the result. It then calls time per counter again to get the end time. So you can see we're getting, okay, it started here. It executes. Then we're getting the time after it's executed. We can get the total time now by subtracting the start time from the end time. So now we'll know how long it took for that function to execute. Then it will print out the function, function name, arguments, and how long it took to run, and it will return the result. And then from here, remember the outer one is returning the time at wrapper, but when it gets called and we're doing our actual timing, it will pass back the result here. Awesome. So let's take a look at using the time it function. Make sure I run it first. And here, I'm just gonna put the at time it decorator above my function. This is a very simple function, right? I'm just saying add numbers, X and Y, and it's going to bring back the answer, but it's going to use this time it wrapper. Didn't do nothing. No, I just created the function. I haven't used it yet. Now let me run the function. And you can see it did what it should. Answer is 23, but it said, hey, your function add numbers, which took those two parameters in. It took 0 0.0007 seconds to run. So really quick, pretty cool. Now I need to test something else. Maybe this function takes a little longer doing a little more work. I'm initializing a variable and I'm using a range function and then I'm going to be adding it up and all kinds of small stuff. Let's run that and let's now try running it. 
This time it says, okay, answer is, and it gives you the total, same thing. But you can see this one took a little more time to run. Now imagine you have a lot of functions and you just need to do like timing and testing and all these. You could do that really easily. And I didn't have to go in and put lots of print statements and everything around, which risks breaking code. And then you have to go back and remove all that code. So this is a nice, elegant way to solve that kind of a need. So let's wrap it up with our takeaways for the day here. First, decorators are an elegant way to extend functions. What does elegance mean, Brian? Elegance is a really crucial word when you're an architect or anyone doing programming, because what it means is it does something that is very unintrusive, that is scalable, that is extensible, and all these things. So it's, in other words, it's cool, it's easy, and it makes you look really impressive. Another way of looking at elegance is almost magical. And this is one in Python that I think qualifies as elegant. Decorators are extensively used throughout the Python ecosystem. So even if you say, Brian, I'm never going to use decorators. I don't want to create them. In fact, you will be using decorators if you do much programming in Python. I guarantee it. They're everywhere. So that's something you need to know. Now, will you write them? I think you probably will if you really do a lot of Python coding. But even if you don't, it's useful to understand when you're using decorators, whether it's Airflow or Django or anything else, what's going on under the covers. Because you, you might see your decorator function breaks and you'll be looking at all this code because that tends to be what Python does. It kind of regurgitates the code from something that breaks to you. And you're like, what is that? Well, it's that decorator function probably. The best part of decorators is that they allow you as the developer to add or remove functionality without changing the decorated function. That is way cool. Uh, that's the part I really love. And in a way, you could think of function decorators a bit like getting inheritance for functions. So we know, all know about class inheritance. You know, we can say, oh, I'm going to build this class and I'm going to inherit another class and on and on. But you don't typically think of that with functions. But I tend to think of decorators as a way of getting function inheritance. I've got a function and I want to extend it. Well, I can just use a decorator. And it's a little bit like having a subclass. It's ideal for providing an easy way for users to plug into your framework. If you are going to get heavily into Python, I don't know what you're doing with it, but if you want to really get in there and build APIs and packages, you know, and you're going to get in there and supply these to other people within your company or outside for the general population, this is a really great way to do it. This is a way to allow it easily for people to sort of magically plug into whatever your framework is, and they don't even know it. Like They don't even have to think about what you're doing in your framework. And that's what's really great from that standpoint. If you're building stuff, it's it's wonderful. And hence, you see everybody using them because it's exactly what it does. So that's it for this time. Please like, share, subscribe, leave any questions and comments. Love to read those. And until next time, I'm Paul and Claire. We're all in this together. Thank you.